the number one problem between men and women nowadays is that we are in this survival mode hmm. and women are in it too. The attachment issues that the research seems to indicate through evolutionary psychology and, and the studies that we've done is... What are the key factors that contribute to men's and women's lack of success in dating today? Most people today are not taught how to give and receive love consistently in relationships. So when they get into a relationship, they are struggling to believe the other person is going to be fair with them, going to take them seriously, and is going to try to meet their needs in any way, shape, or form. So mm. they go in and they're performing and they're playing games and they're trying not to be abandoned or they're trying not to get taken advantage of. Builds a wall between them. They're trying to play games. Everybody is playing a game. Nobody knows what's going on eventually you're doomed. That's how relationships fall apart. Damn, and where does that come from? There's this thing called attachment theory, which teaches that we learn how to connect other people as children. We learn how to connect through our caregivers. Hopefully our parents are there and they teach us that we are loved, we're cared for. I've got four kids, baby number five is doing about three weeks. Wow, congrats. And thank you. So I'm, I'm shaping my children by meeting their needs. When they have some silly need they, they, they think they want, I don't yell at them and say, that's dumb, you're not gonna get that, that's idiotic, get out of my face. I talk them through it and I work with them. Okay, that's what you want. Why do you want that? Help me understand. Okay, can we meet that need? What can we do to take care of you, right? Treat them fairly. Make them know that they're going to be taken seriously. Work kindly with them. Never, ever lie, right? Never say yes, but me no, and then hope they'll forget. Take care of that so they learn that they can be safe in relationships with me and get their needs met. If your parents do that, you develop something called secure attachment. Mm. The research shows at most 50% of adult Americans in the United States have secure attachment. 50%. Wow. Right? So... The other 50% have what we call as insecure attachment. Either you can be anxiously attached where you think you, des you don't deserve love, so you're gonna try to earn approval from people. Mostly women have this, but a lot of men too. This is nice guy syndrome. Or you can be avoidantly attached where you don't trust other people and you think that other people are going to hurt you in some way. So you have to stay safe by avoiding intimacy, by avoiding conflict. You stay safe from other people, right? So it's about safety for those insecure attachment types. It's about safety for everybody, safety mm. for being abandoned, safety for being hurt or trapped. It's endless safety because they've never really felt safe in their life. Wow. Do these attachment styles, I want to get into them, break them each, break that, break each of them down, but do they tend to remain static throughout one's life or do they change based on the relationship that they're in? I love this question because everybody learns about attachment theory on TikTok or on Instagram and they say, oh, that's my style. And it's their star sign for the rest of their life. They can and will change, right? They are learned behaviors. This is experiential learning from childhood. You grew into it because of what you experienced and you learned and you grew from. You can change them as adults, but number one, you have to learn that, that this is even possible. So learning about attachment theory, people hear it. Usually when I'm on a podcast, people say, Adam, can I talk to you afterward? This is me. So if it's after, I'll, I'll be here to talk to you. <laughs> but you learn about it first, and then you learn that better is even possible. And then you start learning about, okay, well, what does a relationship look like? And then you start chasing that, navigating it. Then you have some experiences where people actually meet your needs and care about you, and it changes your whole life. And once you do that, yes, you can change your attachment style and become secure. Wow, how do you, how do you get into this? You become the one of the de facto experts in this field. Yes. And um, yeah, I'm just curious about how, like why, where this all began. Yeah, so I grew up here in California in the Center Valley where family connections are really, really bad up north in, in Modesto, right? Mm. We call it meth dusto because those are the two things you have is meth and dust, Whoa! right? So a lot of broken family connections. Most of my friends growing up had really bad family situations. My extended family was really difficult from multiple generations of adoptions and, and issues like that. So I watched all these family issues happen and I, I took care of people as I was little and tried to help. And then when I turned about 18, 20, I realized, wow, I could do this for a living and then be professional and have skills and help people. So I went to school, became a marriage and family therapist, and I ended up specializing in the most severe cases nobody else would touch, right? Severe trauma, severe family problems, severe personality disorders. And as I dove into those things, unfortunately in school, they don't teach you attachment theory very much. They skip over it really quick. They say, ah, this is mostly for little babies. There's no way to really work on this that we know about. We also don't know why mental health issues form. It's just kind of there. Maybe it's chemical issues We are genetic. We don't know, but here's how to treat the symptoms. Here's the medications they should probably be taking. Hmm. And that's the approach, unfortunately, that a lot of schools have right now. So I dove into the research and started saying, 
what causes these attachment issues or the, these problems. As I learned more about attachment theory, that was everything. But then when I looked online, very few people at the time through the last 10 years were talking about that. And the ones that were, very few people, they just wanted to talk about them. Again, here's your style, live with it forever, right? That's the American way now is identify as as the thing that's wrong with you and then stick with that for your life. So enjoy your victim mindset. Enjoy, well, even just use this as, an, as a reason why you never have to step out of your comfort zone. Mm. You never have to grow. You never have to trust anybody. They should come to you. They should work with you. If you can never trust anybody, then you should never have to trust anybody. They should deal with that, right? Learning to handle that and learning to teach people that, I became the attachment specialist. It's my life now. But this this is what I do because I believe it's at the heart of everything. Wow. I mean, it's it's incredible to hear somebody speak who's so steep in the research, but also as wonderful of a communicator as you are. <laughs> well, thank you. You know, sometimes that's that's what it takes to really make these kinds of fairly complex topics click for people, you know, and uh, and, and, and make them practical and actionable. Mm-hmm. So 50% of the population is secure attached. Mm-hmm. And so does that mean that they're all in healthy, happy relationships or... A lot of them, these are the people that get married young and stay married forever. Mm. These are the people that do get into marriages and stay there. And we look at them and say, how did they do that? What is wrong with these people? They're happy. It's sickening, right? These are these people that we think it, it just works for them. Poof. They just magically had it. No, they, they had parents or grandparents or aunts or uncles or somebody who trained them about love. And they learn to cooperate with other people during conflict. Mm. And they learn to grow in their relationships. And that's all. That's the magic of it. If you can cooperate as a team and con- continuously communicate about the issues you're facing and-, and work on them together, then you can make a relationship work. Just about anybody can do that. Mm. It- it's just that so few people are getting that now. My research shows it's over the last hundred years, it's got worse and worse and worse in every system that we have to the point that we've broken all of the safety nets that are supposed to be redundant to catch us and teach us love all of those are broken too everything is broken nobody knows how to love anymore wow is it just a coincidence that the marriage uh that divorce rates are about 50 percent as well that's no that's 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 an interesting stat it's about 39 percent of first marriages and about 50 percent of all marriages which includes the people who have seven marriages under their belts and seven divorces so yes Yes, absolutely. It, it, it really does coincide with that. In fact, what's really interesting is a lot of couples who have infidelities, right? Infidelities spring almost directly from attachment issues because there's unmet needs that are secret in the relationship that you've never talked about. So when you fix the attachment issues or have secure attachment, affairs almost never happen. Hmm. Almost never. And I say that through all the research, but also as a, years as a marriage and family therapist, affairs almost never happen with secure attachment. So when you have that, what's fascinating? fascinating is the research shows that about 20% of couples are able to take their affair and make their marriage better after the affair, 20%. And the ones who do that, what's fascinating is they use the affair as a catalyst to crack open the conversations they've been refusing to have about their needs, about their fears, about what they want, about all of that, and then trust each other as they heal from it. And their marriage is better after the affair. Wow. Interesting. Better after the affair. I love that. Are there are there any telltale signs that that one might be insecurely attached? <laughs> there are so many. There are so many. So let's let's dive into this a little bit. A, anxious attachment is the one that most often people hear about first, and the people who are anxiously attached believe they are innately unlovable. Something's wrong with them on the inside that their family was able to see, and that's why their family didn't care about them or hurt them or push them away or criticize them because there's something right here. They don't know what it is, but they know it's there. And so every time they do something wrong, they say, oh, that must be it. That's what's wrong with me. And they are endlessly trying to get approval from other people. They are overthinking every conversation. Like, how do I get out of this if someone's mad at me? They are hyper vigilant about people being mad at them. And they are petrified of being abandoned. They do not believe they can live without approval from Mm -hmm. other people. So... They, they, they're number one. They, they are the easiest people to convince that attachment is real because when they hear about it, they think, oh, thank God, it might not be my fault. I might not be an unlovable piece of garbage. Wow. And, and they learn about this and, and they dive into it as hard as they can and they want to learn. Now, the other group, the avoidantly attached people, research shows it's about 25% of Americans. 20% anxiously attached, mostly women, but a lot of men. 25% 
avoidant, mostly men, but a lot of women as well. Growing number of women, actually. That's, that's one, an interesting client group that I'm treating a lot lately mm-hmm. is men who are anxiously attached, women who are avoidantly attached in the couple. Um, but avoidant attachment, they hear me talk about this and they think, what is this guy selling? <laughs> right? This is a scam. What cult is this guy trying to recruit me into? Like love, openness, cooperation. That's never happened. So then they watch me in this fascination for about six months to a year, right? Six months to a year. And they they see if I am fake. They see if I'm going to do something wrong. And eventually they start saying, okay, maybe something's real here. Maybe it's possible. I'm not happy. I'm lonely. You know, I, I, I have success. A lot of these people have an overwhelming financial success. And, and keeping people at arm's length and schmoozing people has helped them do that, but they don't have the intimate connections that would make life better. So they're missing about 80% of the quality of life. They're mm. missing about 80% of the joy, and they don't know that. So they start investigating and learning, and they ease into it. They're like very, very scared cats. They ease into it, and they slowly learn. And when they do, oh, it changes everything. Wow. So interesting. No person is an island, though. How much of the way that we feel in the context of our relationships is due to the other person? Fair question. Very fair question. So arguably, I would say about half. Hmm. Half of it is what the other person's doing and half of it is about what we perceive. Hmm. Because you can be, you can try to be in a relationship with a securely attached person if you have an attachment issue. And what's fascinating is the two pools of people segregate out from each other very sharply for the most part, most part. because Insecurely attached people are endlessly trying to inspire dopamine in the other person, be interesting, be fun, be casual, have a good time, offer sex as fast as possible. They're trying to inspire dopamine in the other person, like, like me, like me, like me, but it never goes deeper. So they don't- Narcissistic, do, it, it's, typically, it, right? It feels like it, but but many of them are doing it as a defense mechanism instead. Mm. And And- what happens is they come across as very shallow. They don't reciprocate. When a secure person tries to take the relationship deeper, it feels uncomfortable, so they, they get scared, they step back, and the secure person says, what's wrong with you? What are you doing? Why are you pulling away? And, and they're very confused, so they segregate out. They don't date. The date. There's two different dating pools, two different friendship pools, two different like communities living side by side that are invisible to each other. And that's why people who have attachment issues say, I have never met somebody who was honest and straightforward and treated me kindly. It's because the two pools segregate out like this without meaning to. Wow. I've been in relationships where I've felt avoidant. Mm -hmm. I've been in relationships where I felt anxious. Mm -hmm. And I've been in relationships where I felt secure. Mm -hmm. And um, I actually thought that I was avoidant primarily avoidant for a really long time because Mm -hmm. I I guess I've been primarily in relationships Mm -hmm. where I've felt the need to be avoidant. Mm -hmm. Maybe part of that had to do with the fact that I wasn't all that into the other person. Maybe part of that is due to the fact that the other person was making me feel the need to be avoidant for whatever reason. If they're anxiously attached, they're going to grab onto you Mm. and then you're going to be compelled to meet their needs. They're going to give and give and give, do 10 nice things for you and expect you to figure out what they need. And then if you try to pull back and take space for yourself, they're going to grab on even tighter and you're like, what? You can't breathe and you're going to chew your own arm off to get away and they will make you feel more avoidant. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. And then I, over the past couple of months, I've been seeing somebody and uh, for the first time in a long time, a very long time, I mean, probably since I've, since well before I began even this podcast, and uh, there, there have been, I haven't felt avoidant for the first time. I would, I would have previously said that my attachment style is to be avoidant attachment, which is something that I've tried to work on through therapy and, you know, just like voraciously consuming content mm-hmm. from, from mm-hmm. you and the mm-hmm. like. And then I remember early early in the in the relationship for the, about the first two months there were times when i felt anxious for the first time in my life and it transitioned i think um recently over the past over the past because it's been about three and a half months at this point mm-hmm. over the past month i felt much more secure which is a very new feeling for me is it okay if i dig in on this yeah ask dig questions? In, free, okay yeah. Cool. i'm excited i love these yeah yeah um often what we experience with avoidant people is that they start off pretty strong and they give love and care to the other person. But over time that starts to fizzle because they're they're mostly dopamine focused in relationships mm. a lot of times. And they give oxytocin bonding to the other person, but they don't receive much themselves. 
what I've seen make the big difference though is if the other person starts having more substantial conversations with you about expectations, make it very clear and low pressure for you what they're looking for and they just lay it on the table. Is that what your partner's been doing in the last month? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. I think it's, and it, what is that? It all comes down to honesty, transparency, vulnerability. Yes. Right. Yes. People with avoidant attachment, they believe there are hidden strings on everything and that everybody else is going to do nice things for you. And then they're waiting to figure out how to how to manipulate you, how to exploit you. What does this guy want from me? What does this lady want from me? Right. So if if you don't if you don't do enough for them, you're afraid that they're going to turn on you very often. Right. Mm. You have to manage their mood. Keep them happy. Then they'll do the right things for you when the time's right. If they say, look, here's all that I want from you. Here's all that I want from you. Anything outside of that, fine. If you want time for yourself, tell me, and I'm not gonna wrap myself in a shawl and sit in the corner crying till you get home. I'm gonna go do these cool things, and you take all the time you want for you, and if you need anything, you tell me right here, and I will do it. Hmm. And that begins this process of trust and intimacy, and then when you take them at their word, and they say, great, you want time? Pff, go, have a day, hmm. enjoy your life. I will be right over here having a blast. I'll be happy when you come home. And when you test them like that and they pass the test, it begins to heal your attachment as well. Wow. Communication. Communication. Like grown-ups. It's amazing. Hmm. But but so many of us and we laugh, but so many of us are programmed to be utterly terrified of that concept mm. because when we're one year old and our parents teach us not to do that because that makes them angry it makes them upset they push us away if they are not trustworthy if they're inconsistent your brain says i never want to feel this hurt or this scared ever again for the rest of my life mm. so i will never be this open with anybody and when you reach a moment where you're wanting to that fear crashes in and says, I'm going to get so hurt. I will never let this happen. And that's why people don't just poof, fix it. Hmm. Yeah. And being willing to have difficult conversations that also probably likely stems from childhood, right? Yes. Like a parent who's willing to sit you down and have difficult conversations. Yes. Cause I mean, even as an adult, even as an adult, as an adult, you I, I find myself being pulled towards comfort. Like, mm -hmm. Oh, don't bring that up. Right. You know, that's not, that's right. going to create some, but I think it's always uh, what I've found anecdotally in my non expert anecdotal, you know, experience mm -hmm. is that it, there's, there's a lot of incentive to getting in front of problems before they become problems. Oh yeah. Oh yes. Yeah. So one thing I have coaching clients come to me all the time and they say, Adam, what's the one thing we can do? One thing we can do, and I'm going to tell you to start doing this. Um, one thing that we can do proactively that will make sure we don't have giant problems down the line. And what I tell them is this, have a weekly check-in. Wow. Run your relationship even more. Run your relationship like a business. Don't run it like this romantic, happy thing. Run it like a business. If you owned a business, if you were co-founding a business together, okay? You would not have one beginning sort of meeting where you talked about how you love each other and you're going to have so much fun and then go out there and never talk about that again. Never talk about realities. Never talk about the issues. Never discuss it. Never make eye contact. <laughs> Just try to run your business in two separate areas forever hmm. alone. That would never, ever work. You'd go bankrupt. Same thing needs to happen here. So weekly check-ins. My wife and I have been married for 15 years. Our wedding anniversary is uh, the due date of our fifth child. It's in three weeks. I'm either. Um, Weekly check-ins, at least. During peaceful times, weekly check-ins, okay? Every, for us, every Thursday night. Hey, how you doing? How you feeling in our relationship? How's our relationship feeling to you? What do you need from me in the coming week? What are you facing in the coming week? How can I be of assistance to you, okay? In business terms, what is your department facing? <laughs> how can we shift the budget? What can we do to take care of that so the business succeeds? We talk about our marriage, and, and we have to, because hmm. that, it may, keeps our marriage strong. During really bad times, really rough times, every two or three days, okay? During like overwhelmingly peaceful, boring times, maybe once a month, don't, don't, well, don't let it go to once a month, but once a week or every other week, right? Go out for a date, have a great time doing this. I'm telling you, set this up. How do you feel in our relationship? What are you facing in the coming week? What can I do to be of help for you? Do that and you will not have big problems in your relationship because you'll solve everything when it's this big. Mm, it reminds me of that, of that famous JF, JFK line, the time to fix the roof is when the sun is shining. <laughs> yes. 
exactly. If you set this up, then not only do you solve problems when they're tiny, but you also have diligent practice every single week talking about difficult things and solving them as a team. And that releases a hormone called vasopressin in the brain. When you solve problems with somebody, it releases a hormone for you. Men have more receptors for vasopressin than women do, but we both have it. And the research shows that that hormone is the one that uh, reinstitutes the honeymoon phase for us because then it sparks oxytocin desire again. So we want to bond with that person. The brain says, this person is my ally. I trust them. I want them to stay around. So it keeps them around. If you want 10 honeymoons through the course of your marriage, if anybody wants that, start solving problems together with once a week check-ins. I love it. With uh, Sydney, my producer, um, longtime producer on the podcast, former assistant, now producer, mm -hmm. we uh, we do what's called, we call a vibe check, mm -hmm. you know? Yep. Even when things are great, exactly. you know, I I like to check in with her and vice versa with just a, a, a vibe check where I'm like, how can I support you? How can I be better at what it is that I'm doing? How can I help you be better at what it is that you're doing? That's it. That's it. You are doing one of the best relationship tactics right there with Sydney, and you need to be doing that with your partner. Mm -hmm. In fact, you can do that with everybody. Do that with everybody. I do that with my children. Every week I try to check in with each of my children as, as their age allows. Hey, how you doing? How are you doing? How, much, how, how are you feeling with me? Mm. Are we feeling good, the two of us? Is there good trust here? Do you feel loved? I ask my kids, do you feel loved? And if they don't, they'll say, well, and I say, okay, well, what is it? Like, what, what do you need me to do? And they don't say, well, I need a pony. They always say, I want some time with you. I haven't had much time with you lately. And I say, and I think, well, it has been like a week or two since we went out. You and me just does. Okay. Well, you know what? Let's plan that in the next few days. I'm going to take you out to lunch. Or we're going to go on an adventure. I just flew my, my oldest daughter. She's six. I flew her out with me on a business trip and we had a blast for a couple of days. She just lived the high life and it was, it was what she needed. That's amazing. A lot of men today are struggling with dating. Yes. Um, they're struggling in general. Men yes. are having a oh, real... Yes. Difficult time, Absolutely. I think, these days. For those fellas in the audience that are struggling with dating, what do they not understand about women that might help them be more successful in their dating lives? The number one problem between men and women nowadays is that we are in this survival mode, hmm. and women are in it too. The attachment issues that the research seems to indicate through evolutionary psychology and, and the studies that we've done is... Let's say it's a thousand years ago, okay? You're living in your nice, peaceful village. You're like four years old. And the Danes sail up and burn your village to the ground, kill most of the people, take them away. You are one of a few survivors left and you're in the ruins of your village. You are probably not going to survive just trusting everybody, being loving and open. Probably very few people are going to have resources to share. You will shift into a scarcity, what Twitter calls scarcity mindset. And scarcity mindset is attachment issues. Nobody's going to be fair to me. People are scraping to survive. Nobody's going to take care of me. No one's going to help me. People are going to hurt me. So we shift into attachment problems. And that's what we're doing now, right? Or our parents, we have generational trauma from multiple uh, generations. So, so parenting nowadays is just handing down trauma. Mm. And, and they're surviving that way. So women are doing the same. Now, what's fascinating about men and women is in almost every culture that we see, men cover the outside. Men are, are perimeter creators. We're structure creators. We build, we protect, we draw circles, and we protect the outside. We're designed for it. Our biology is designed for it. Women tend to take that space we have created and they fill it and, and they grow through it. I was just reading research lately that women would have pulled in most of the calories for hunter gatherers by all of their gathering. But to do that, they have to have a safe area to gather in, right? And they grow and they nurture. And that's what we call feminine energy is, is the feminine d d dynamic and the masculine dynamic. And a lot of women on, on TikTok especially are talking about how they're endlessly in their masculine. Masculine is to protect and provide right? Mm. We don't have that. So women are stepping forward and have been for a couple generations. Men come in and they try to appease women the way that they tried to appease their mothers. They try to relate to them like a mother. They try to relate to them in like, hey, we're both going to be men together in this relationship almost. It's masculine to masculine. And the women don't want that. 
So the women are gravitating toward any man with any kind of masculine energy, which unfortunately is a lot of the really manipulative avoidant men. Mm. And they have learned to mimic that energy, but not the good piece that will actually form loving relationships. They've learned to mimic a piece for insecure women who are looking for protection and comfort. And then there's all these nice guys who are like, why do women only like jerks? No, they love masculinity, which mm. is personal sovereignty, right? Honor, integrity, honesty, that courage to live life by your terms, and then to build a network with other men. Rome is a great example of this. The The village of Rome was founded with, with according to legend, a single man who killed his brother because they couldn't agree on where to build it. So he killed his brother, so he's alone. And he says, I will pull in all the unwanted men and we will build a village here. And they built Rome. And then they had all these men and said, now we have to add, we, we've built a home, we've built this village, we've built it out, we're protected, we've built resources, now we're ready for women in our village. And they reached out to try to negotiate and bring women in to try to build that. That's what men today are missing masculinity, personal sovereignty, strength, connection with other men first, and then use that network to grow and show that you are even ready to start building and providing structure. And then the women, they, they crave to be near you because you are safe. You're strong. You're, you're, you're courageous. You're reputable. You are a man who inspires respect. That's what women are looking for. Mm. And to men today don't know how to do that. Wow. The men are becoming more, they're being feminized and women are becoming masculinized. That has been the structure that we have followed to try to rebuild Yikes. from the trauma of the past. Yes. And I think men are coming out of that, right? I, I, I think that we had the child for, for version of, of masculinity in the 80s and 90s, right? Men trying to appease women. We had happy wife, happy life, one of the worst things in the mm. entire world. We had men just checked out, fathers checked out, fathers dead, generations of dead men or checked out men or traumatized men. And then children, boys growing up trying to figure out how to relate and all we had was mom. So we related to the feminine that way. Then we entered this juvenile masculinity phase, right? It's pickup artistry, it's red pill culture. Mm. It, it's it's all of those those things like, look at me, look how many Bugattis I have. Look at me flex, I'm so strong. I'm sleeping with five women and they all know it and they're all insecure about it. Ha ha ha, I'm so big, right? That's juvenile masculinity. Mm -hmm. I think that we are at the next step, right? And I have a lot of men coming to me to learn this next step of masculinity. Personal sovereignty, responsibility, integrity, honor mature, secure, secure masculinity is making a rebirth right now. I wow. believe it. Wow. I love that. This is not a, a political show, but I no. mean, you, you do tend to see that, um, you know, masculinity, there were, you know, there, there are headlines that you'll sometimes catch on Twitter. Publications like, you know, MSNBC will, will make really over the top claims like fitness is, has become a far right obsession. Masculinity has become a some, mm -hmm. you know, some sort of far right toxic mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. phenomena, which I just, I, I can't help but roll my eyes when I see those Correct. headlines. But do you know why they're doing that? Why? Because the only masculine men that they're seeing, the only men embodying that right now, or for the last couple of decades, have primarily been very manipulatively avoidant men. Not mm -hmm. the nice version of avoidant that just don't want to be hurt, but the very manipulative version that say, I, other people will take from me, so I will take from them. Mm -hmm. That's what they see. And, and and nothing against Andrew Tate himself, I don't know the guy, but, but the swaggering, self-absorbed masculinity that he embodies and he tries to teach to other men and show, that right there is the image that they have. That's the only image they have of a grown up masculine man, but it's very avoidant. It's very arguably into personality disorder territory. It's very predatory and it denies any level of responsibility toward others by giving in endlessly. Your, even your personal sovereignty is eroded because you're giving in to nothing but hedonism and then fear, fear of intimacy and fear, own openness, and then hedonism to try to cope. And, and, and that's not masculinity. Personal sovereignty and then from that springs the ability to take responsibility for others, mm. right? That's masculinity in a nutshell. And we have not seen that for so many decades. All we have seen is this swaggering characterization of it that men need to move beyond. Mm. But the fact that that has become such a prominent archetype and and such a villainized oh, archetype, yeah. Oh, yeah. Do, you, do you think that there's any relationship between that phenomena that we're now seeing in the media and the the widespread mental health uh like 
the, the pandemic of mental health challenges that we're now seeing as well? I think the pandemic of mental health challenges comes down to those attachment issues that are forming generations of trauma. And then you hit that attachment issue because when you are at two years old and your brain says, no one will ever love me. And I am utterly alone in this world at two years old, you amp up your nervous system for maximum anxiety to stay alive. And your brain says, anytime something bad happens, your brain says, no one will ever help me. So the only thing I can do is worry more. So it clicks it up and clicks it up and clicks it up. So most of the people who come to me for coaching now, they come to me at seven out of 10 chronic stress every single day. Hmm. Seven out of 10, like, max, all, like top, top level, everything is up here. And they're living here all the time. They can never relax their body. Their eating is terrible. Every massive inflammation of their body. They can't stop at night, can't stop thinking, insomnia, stress stress, all kinds of pain, a lot of chronic pain. And they come to me because they've had a lifetime of anxiety. And then eventually you crash into depression because you mm. learn that you're helpless. You can't stop the pain or the fear. So you crash into depression. It's much easier to develop PTSD when you have a traumatic event. They go into, into, they go into uh, panic attacks very, very easily, some people. And then your brain starts dealing with that stress in a number of bad ways. Your brain starts trying to turn off the stress. You don't have a seizure. Arguably, some some experts think that could be some of the origin of bipolar disorder. Wow. Of manic episodes could be your brain flooding with chemicals to turn off that prefrontal cortex and give you a rest so that you don't have a seizure. Instead, you have a manic episode where you binge pleasure, right? There's all kinds of ways that these maximum problems with mental health are venting the stress that go all the way back to when we're one or two years old and we learn those attachment styles. Mm. So what's the antidote, Adam? Help us turn, turn over a new leaf. <laughs> the antidote is to learn about attachment, number one. So hopefully everybody at home has learned that. The answer to number two, the, the next step is then to do something about it. Gather as much knowledge as you can. Specifically, what we need is two things here. Number one is what's called models, right? What is even possible? In your case, what you're learning about. What does a healthy relationship look like? Yeah. What does love look like? What does it look like when your partner gives you space to breathe and doesn't mm. handcuff themselves to you on day three, mm. right? What is a healthy model of a friendship? What is a healthy model of a marriage? Healthy model of this? We don't even have those. So we don't know what to aim for. We're just blindly trying to feel our way through. So models. And then number two is just, okay, I see what I what's over there, but I can't reach it. Skills right? What skills am I missing? Your parents didn't have those either. Your parents didn't model for you and they didn't have the skills either. So models and skills. There's a number of ways people can learn this. I have the attachment bootcamp video course on my website right Tell now. Tell us about that. Uh, so the attachment bootcamp video course is a program I designed for my 15 years of training and experience of doing this. It walks you through the 10 clear steps of how to fix your attachment, including describing where this comes from, from evolutionary psychology, the brain chemicals behind it, bonding, differences for men and women in sexual relationships, all the way from I am utterly alone to I am happily married with children. And that walks you through how to create that in very 10, 10 clear, simple steps. That's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. I mean, I grew up without, without good models mm -hmm. for healthy relationships. Mm -hmm. And I, and as a result, I was not able to acquire the skills from Correct. my, you know, from my, from my parenting. My, I had to learn on the job, so to speak, through listening to experts as yourself, reading books, watching TED Talks, going to therapy. Mm -hmm. I, I began a therapy journey about two years ago um, to help me kind of unravel a lot of the attachment issues that I was, that I was having in prior relationships. Mm -hmm. But yeah, my parents were wonderful parents, mm -hmm. amazing parents, but their relationship was terrible. Yeah. Like my dad was, you know... You know, he, uh, an amazing father, but his, his relationship with my mom was not great. Mm -hmm. My mom, you know, was not the she was a she was a very loving wife. My mom loved my dad. There's no question about that. But you know, there were there were I never really saw what growing up. I, I had no um, there was no yeah I, I didn't have that foundation put into place because the relationship the the most important relationship that I witnessed growing up was so dysfunctional right for years right. years and years and years people don't think about that but children grow up are supposed to grow up inside a marriage and feel it and see it and be participants in it they're supposed to and that's how you learn and grow or you don't mm. and most of us today are not so you did not but you're learning now what what is one model or skill that you're looking for maybe I can Lay something out for you here today. Anything. Be, hmm. be as selfish as you want. Yeah. What is something you want? Model or skill? Well, I I think for a long time it was being 
knowing how to be vulnerable in relationships. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know what that word meant. I thought vulnerability (laughs) was just like sharing things about yourself, Uh you know? Um, but, but what I've learned and I'm sure you can add more color and nuance to this, but it, I think the, 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 the most important aspect of it to me that I think has led to this relationship that I'm currently in this new, amazing, wonderful relationship that I'm currently in, it's being able to, um, risk like rejection, right. To like Mm -hmm. say things that might you know, where there's risk, yeah. right? Where there's risk, as opposed to being guarded yeah. in the name of personal safety, right? Mm-hmm. Like risking your safety, so, but risking your safety so that you can be more honest and transparent with mm-hmm. your intentions, mm-hmm. with your feelings, with your emotions, Absolutely. you know? Because if you tell somebody that you really care about them and you're loving the way that this is going, uh-huh. you are creating risk for yourself. Correct. Right? Yeah, correct. That they might not feel the same way. Correct. And so that's scary. It is. It's terrifying. Yeah. Do you know why most female sex drives drop off at 12 months and completely die? No. It's because most people don't have those conversations right Mm. there. Those conversations that are scary and terrifying, those conversations that are risk of risk of being rejected or of being embarrassed, right? Or or even if they do agree, just like, wow, man, that was pathetic. Really? You said (laughs) that? Like, what a simp, right? (laughs) And we're afraid of that. We're afraid of the other person laughing or thinking we're weird or or anything like that. There's so many things, right? I I saw there's that meme, right? Well, the worst thing that she can say is no. And then she says, ew, instead, right? That's Mm, even worse. Yeah. And, And that's what we're afraid of. And Keep in mind that most relationships begin, yeah, they begin with oxytocin and they begin with dopamine and fun and and building and and connecting. They are supposed to start building with oxytocin and vasopressin and those happen with deep, substantial conversations. They happen by taking risks and then the other person rewards that risk with trust and with love, right? And we go back and forth and reciprocate and we learn over time, I can trust this person. And what we do is we start releasing this hormone called oxytocin, which it does a, a tremendous number of things. One thing it does is release what's called GABA, gamma amino biuric acid. GABA is responsible, number one, for melatonin synthesis in the body, so helping you sleep at night. It's also a natural anti-inhibit, uh, an inhibitory neurotransmitter, which is a natural anti-anxiety and antidepressant. It suppresses the release of cortisol in your body. It also helps with chronic pain, right? It also makes us feel loved and safe, and it increases the female sex drive. It's female Viagra. They've been looking for this. It's having to talk with your girlfriend about how you enjoy being with her, right? (laughs) You hold her hand, that's female Viagra. But most guys are not building that because they don't know how. They don't think she wants that from you. They think that's pathetic. They think she'll be turned off. So most guys skip that. And at one year, her brain is saying, he's not invested in me. Hmm. He doesn't open up to me. He doesn't trust me. He doesn't ask me for things. He has no needs that I can help him with. I am nothing but a warm body to him. Therefore, he's going to leave me for somebody else at some point. So I'd better not sexually invest because I can get pregnant and then he'll leave and I have to raise a baby alone. So evolutionary biology has trained the female sex drive to crank down at 12 months if you're not emotionally investing with them. So those embarrassing talks that you're talking about, number one, are feeding her and making her feel incredible. Ask her, do you like it when I do this or do you dislike it? Do I look pathetic or do I look good? What is it? And she will gush and say yes and she'll hold your hand and she'll hug you and she'll be so happy even that you ask that question, right? And you can tell her, I hope she's listening right now. Hi, (laughs) I hope she's listening. And that she comes to you at some point and says, please don't be embarrassed. I love when you ask me those things or when you talk to me, right? Women do, they love it. If you do that, her sex drive at 12 months will go up. Guys, I mean, you'll be chasing her off with a stick. Mm. You'll be asking for the night off. If men learn to build that emotional intimacy with their wife or their girlfriend and, and create that emotional intimacy and foster it, in a good way, man. You you never ever want for sex ever again. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, I think I think some guys think it's masculine though to stay guarded and to like keep it all bottled up. Stoic is what I hear, but really what it is is protecting yourself from emotionally opening up. Keep in mind that a hundred years ago, the average work week was one hundred hours a, a week. Right. And it didn't stop till Henry Ford revolutionized it with a 40 hour work week, which he got sued for, by the way. And he paid his workers the same amount. And his competition said that's unreasonable. We can't deal with that. Right. So 100 hours a week, fathers were never home. Fathers stopped sharing emotions with their family. Fathers guarded. Right. So the fathers 
kept all their stress and pain at the door as much as they could. They didn't come home and whine and complain to their wife. I saw a video not too long ago about from the 1940s or 1950s, black and white, of a wife sitting at the table saying, I want you to come home after your 16 hour work shift. 16 hours, I want you to come home and tell me about your day. And he says, all I'm gonna come home to and tell you is, is how much pain I'm in how much I hate my job or I'm just sitting there doing the same thing. I don't want to do that to you. Mm -hmm. And she's begging him for the intimacy of sharing. And he's saying, absolutely not. I'm not going to bring that to you. And that's, that's the dichotomy where we're at. Men don't understand what the value is of sharing solution focused sharing that maintains your strength and shows like, this is what I'm enduring. I'm not guilting you and I'm not falling apart. This is what I'm enduring and I'm not sure what to do about it. Is there anything we as a team can do to help this, right? Like a business, right? Solution focused sharing is the answer to that vulnerability problem. Do I share nothing or do I sob uncontrollably on the floor like a child? No, you share like a man. You share and you look for solutions and then sometimes you simply acknowledge the reality. This is how I am. This is how I'm going to be. I'm going to minimize my stress in the home. If you could do this to help me, that would be so helpful. When wives hear that, they love it. They love it. Hey, here's something you can do to help me manage the stress load of me taking care of our family because I'm literally killing myself at work and dying. If I come home and you do this thing that takes care of me, you are fulfilling this role as well. And wives listen for those moments. If you deny them that, you tell them you are worth nothing. Sit over there and be pretty until I'm ready to have sex. And I will replace you with the next woman over here because you've done nothing for me. Mm. When you give them that and say, we are a team, they are secure. They are invested. They know you're invested. Everything gets so much better. So please don't be afraid in your relationship to do that. Ask her more questions. Give her things to do. Tell her when you're struggling. Even if you don't know the solution, seek one with her. Talk with her about that. You will see her thrive. Hmm. So good. I mean, I never, I, I, ne I'm not even being hyperbolic here. I don't think I've ever seen my dad hold my mom's hand. My, my parents got a divorce when I was 18. Yeah. Throughout that entire time, I don't think I saw my dad hold my mom's hand. I don't really, re I mean, maybe a little bit of affection I would see, but um, but I never saw, my dad is not the most vulnerable vulnerable guy, even today, even mm -hmm. with my brothers. Like mm -hmm. he's very, he can be very obtuse with, you know, like mm -hmm. he's having some like some health challenges and it's like, Sometimes it feels like pulling teeth to mm -hmm. get to the heart of how he's actually feeling. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe that's a, do you think that's a generational thing? It's, it's generations of men struggling to keep their families alive in a decaying system where men were dying from World War I, World War II, suicide from the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl, and, and barely staying alive through Vietnam, through Korea, all mm. of those generations just suffering and suffering and suffering and dying and dying and dying. That's where masculinity disappeared because it, it ceased to be transmitted from one generation to the next. Um, there, there's a, a, a very famous music video uh, from Twisted Sister. Mm -hmm. We're not going to take it. And at the beginning is the father screaming at his son, I carried an M16. What are you going to do? You're going to die in this world. How dare you grow your hair? Who are you going to be? And he's screaming at him. And the son just can't, it explodes at the end. That was the brokenness of trying to transmit masculinity from here to here. That was where it died. Okay. That was the silent generation and the greatest generations trying to pass it to the baby boomers. And many of them, it didn't work. Some of the boomers got the message that suffering is love. And some of them got the message that suffering is pointless. Hmm. And that's why they're currently tripling their divorce rates in the 80s, in their 80s even now. They're still getting divorced. But that's why that, that brokenness happened through generations of struggle and suffering to nobody has ever loved me and life is nothing but pain, so mm. I'm going to make it about me. And that is where it broke, and that's where we're rebuilding from now. Wow. That's where it happened. Wow. Therapy has played a really important role for me. At the very least, I mean, what it what it helped me do was to see the to see my own shit, you know? It was like a mirror for me to yeah. see. Because, you know, I'm, I grew up with a great childhood, very privileged in New York City with parents that loved me. And so, you know, the problems that I've had in relationships, specifically one relationship that was, you know, on and off for a very long time, a, a girl was in and out of my life. And, you know, I think it's very easy as a guy, and I certainly am guilty of this, I would, you know, attribute all of the problems in that past relationship to, to her, you know, mm -hmm. my, my quote unquote crazy ex. Mm -hmm. But what therapy helped me realize is that she wasn't crazy, that she 
you know, she was brought up with a certain set of values and pattern, you know, patterns and, 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 and issues that she had to deal with. And then I was brought up with, Mm. you know, I, I inherited another set of values Mm -hmm. and challenges and, Mm -hmm. you know, and then you put two people together with undealt with trauma and, and insecure attachment styles. And you just get, yeah, it's just a, it's just a recipe for disaster. It is. It is. And so therapy, yeah, really helped me to see that, you know, that the problems weren't all, you know, attributable to her. Like I was there 50% of the time. Yeah. It's, it, what's so funny is how fast though that can turn around if both, if both people are willing to work on it. I have seen darn near miracles happen. I remember I had one couple come to me and they had just discovered that he was having an affair two weeks before they got into me two weeks before and he wasn't sure if he wanted to go with his wife or with his mistress he wasn't sure like where am i gonna go i'm not sure and she was also by pregnant by the way and mistress no uh the wife the wife wife was pregnant he was i'm not sure two weeks right two weeks they came in very raw what was fascinating was both of them were very avoidant Hmm. both of them were very avoidant so i sat them down and said okay look Here's the problem. Neither one of you has ever talked to the other person about your needs. Neither one of you has ever really opened up and shared with anybody. Guy over here, you're chasing dopamine with a new mistress, but you're going to chase jo- dopamine endlessly for the rest of your life because it wears off in about six or seven months. So you're going to need a new mistress every six months for the rest of your life. I'm just mm. telling you that. And you're also going to have this child. So if you want to invest here, this would be the time. So are you guys willing to sit down and learn about attachment really quick, learn what I have to teach you, and then start talking with each other as if you're running a business? And they both said, why not? So three weeks later, three weeks later from doing those weekly check-ins, from having the conversations like you're having with your partner, three weeks, they both came in glowing. They said, our marriage has never been happy. We've never been happier as a couple, even when we were dating. It has never felt this good with anybody. We are each other's first loves. It is incredible. We are blown away by how this has transformed and we can't wait for it to keep going. Please keep teaching us. Three weeks, five weeks after an affair was discovered, three weeks, he was so invested in that marriage because that he had never felt that like you. He had never really felt that connection before. And she was overjoyed to find that connection with him before their child was even born. So now they got to pass on new skills to their child. Hmm which was incredible. When you learn this stuff, it, it changes everything and very quickly. Wow. So is, is an affair, so an affair is not, shouldn't necessarily be the death knell to a relationship. It doesn't have to be if both people, number one, are willing to do the work. If both people are willing to do the work, right? If somebody is burned out, exhausted, it's the, the affair is just the cap on a miserable experience of betrayal after betrayal after betrayal. They have no trust for this person anymore. They're just way too exhausted and they're done. Very little you can do to try to rebuild that at that point. Very little, right? Both people have to be willing to at least try. But if both people are willing to try, any relationship can be saved. Wow. Forgiveness. I mean, forgiveness is, is, you know, I think it's, it's so important to be able to forgive. Well, and what is forgiveness? It's not just, okay, I have a good feeling for you, right? You, you punch me. If you punched me in the face right now, I would say, okay, well, I have a good feeling for you since <laughs> I forgive you. It's, it is understanding that they will never do it again and then doing what is truly best for them anyway, hmm. right? Me doing what is truly best for you anyway. That's forgiveness. It is giving kindness to the other person even after they've hurt you. And it is learning that they won't do it again. That's also part of forgiveness typically too. So. It's so important. It is. It's so important. What about for people who are single and looking to meet that special someone? Mm. What are the biggest mistakes that mm. people seem to make on the first date? I mean, I guess men and women are likely make different. <laughs> there are different mistakes that each gender would might make. Two but. things. Yeah, two things. Um, number one is relying on apps too much, right? So in 1995, the research shows that 65% of couples were meeting through family and friends. In fact, throughout human history, about 95% or 99% of couples met through family and friends. Mm. It's how we're designed to meet. To People come pre-vetted through your network. They are pre-filtered to have the same values as you and be ready for you. And the people who care about you most connect the two of you. 
and it makes sense, right? Blind dates and, and such like that, and even arranged marriages or assisted marriages, but blind dates even would be something, right? Most people have most people had that in the 1995 era. People don't have that now because people don't have friend or family networks anymore. It's mm. not that that system stopped working. It's that we stopped having friends and family. We stopped asking, hey, you know what? I'm looking for a partner. Do you know somebody? Keep your eye out for somebody who would be a good match for me. We don't have 10 people searching for us, right? We don't have 10 married women in our circle who are obsessive about matchmaking, trying to find somebody. It's amazing when you find somebody, when you build your network first, people bring you partners. They throw good partners at you saying, get married, be happy. And they try to build that connection for you. So number one, build your friend and family network back, right? Number two, if, you, if, if, if you're afraid, a lot of people, if you're afraid that's gonna take too much time, it's one of the best investments you can make in your life, but if you're afraid that's going to take much time, too much time and you need a partner tomorrow, and if you're going to use the dating apps, use them correctly. Most people use dating apps wrong and social media wrong, okay? Dating apps is not get on there and invest dopamine or, or try to inspire dopamine in other people. You are not an Amazon listing for a package. That's what people advertise. Like, look at this, look at this product, look at these products, <laughs> right? Look at this, here's what I do, here's how much money I make, here's how interesting I am. You're, you're not gonna do that because you're competing for the next binge. Not just other people, but, uh, but Amazon, Netflix, you're competing for that, right? You're in that dopamine market. In Instead, get on there and treat your dating app and your profile more like a job listing and a resume at the same time. So, and people get very squeamish when I tell them this, but it works. At the top, what do you do on a resume? I'm looking, seeking full-time employment in this industry, right? Seeking a long-term committed relationship with a loving partner. Put that at the top of your bio, right? Men, this is the stupidest thing. Men have convinced themselves that women don't want committed relationships anymore hmm. because they're used to avoidant women who are afraid of committed relationships, right? Wow. Avoidant women often run away from committed relationships, so these men get used to that, and really narcissistic women who are all over the media, and you would think every woman in America is now incredibly narcissistic, but men are afraid to do that. Women are afraid to talk about commitment too, because they think men don't want it either. Looking for a loving, committed relationship with a loving partner, put that at the top. Then list characteristics you're looking for, good moral characteristics, your ethics, right? Honesty, integrity, loyalty. Like I'm looking for somebody who values honesty, who is always truthful, somebody who is cooperative and caring, somebody who uses reason to solve problems, right? List these things. Because you're looking for those people. Not a vegan, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Th things like that. Eats eight pounds of meat a day, yeah, right? Whatever. Go, yeah. But here's what's interesting is when you do that, most people will read that and the reverse psychology kicks in. You're valuing these. You must have these. And they, they're interested now because it's your resume saying, oh, look, I, it's a job listing, but also a resume. So then they think, okay, they want a committed relationship and these are their characteristics. Wow, that sounds pretty good. At the end of it, here's what you do. Very simple, guys. Very, very simple, especially for men. Please do not contact unless you're serious about relationships, right? No casual contact, no casual, not interested in casual. Please only contact if you're looking for a committed relationship, something like that. Put that at the end, right? It looks amazing because it shows that you are not willing to just show up and have meaningless sex for 90 days and then see if it's going to work. Hmm. Because people are not really looking at the people that are looking for that are, are, are going to be looking for that. And the people who want commitment are looking for commitment. So do you want to attract everybody? arguably nobody. Do you want to just be there? Or do you want to attract your select 20%, 30% of people who are looking for exactly what you're looking for? Niche down is what I'm saying. Niche down. Niche down on the dating apps. If you use it correctly, it can work. There's riches in the niches. There's riches in the niches. There are wonderful people on the dating apps. There are some. Um, by and large, the people on the dating apps, it seems, are, are more the people who have attachment challenges. That's why they're they're seeking love with complete strangers. They don't have a network to bring them people, right? So they're seeking it with strangers, which is unfortunate, but it doesn't make them bad people and it doesn't make it unworkable. It just means that you have to learn to filter correctly mm. and then have conversations on the first couple of dates. I teach a three-date method that filters people on the first three dates. The three-date method? The three-date method. It's very, very simple. Give so, us a tease of what that, what that entails. Oh, so on the first date, you test for primal chemistry. You see if you guys are going to be a decent match. You can talk. You can have fun, right? You and I are having a great time. We got good primal chemistry here. Um, at the end of the first date, you go in for a big ask. You say, hey, you know what? I just want to make sure we're on the same page. I'm looking for a committed relationship. We don't have to get married tomorrow, but 
I am looking for that down the road. I just want to make sure. Are you looking for that too? Is if it, so, can it be scary though to it's terrifying. be so explicit? It's like, terrifying for most people. But here's what's fascinating. The people who will be turned off by you mentioning a committed relationship are the people that you don't want to be in a relationship with. Hmm. The people who say, yeah, I am looking for a committed relationship. That's cool that you can bring it up that clear because it tells me that you are really interested in one. Right? You're filtering perfectly for the person who's there. Yeah. If that's what you want, then filter that way. It's going to weed out like it's the, weed the out avoidant it. types. It's going to weed out like 80% of people. Oh. Second date, you start weeding more carefully for what I call personal chemistry and values and, and things like that. And then third date, you start weeding out for attachment chemistry. You see if they can even have vulnerable conversations on the third date. You have that conversation. By the end of the third date, most people are ready to ask for exclusivity by the end of the third date when they use the system. Whoa. It's amazing. So I just had somebody write into me the other day and say, Adam, I used your three date method. It took me a couple months to find the right woman. And now we're engaged to get married. And he was lonely before that. And he's happily engaged at this point. So I know it works. It's scary. But when you have the courage to do it, it works. It's amazing. No, so cool. It, um, yeah, I mean, dating, the, the dating apps, I find, you know, for me personally at this stage in my life, they're they're better, they're a double-edged sword. Mm -hmm. They're better to me than a nightclub. Yes. Oh, yes. Better than a bar. Oh, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, for all the the hate, you know, because I like at this point, I want to spend less time on my smartphone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. However, if it means that I'm not, you know, going to get to not not have to go to the frequent the bars and the clubs to meet the kind of girl that I'm looking for. I mean, on the one hand, she's likely not the right girl for for me, hypothetically, because I've met a girl mm -hmm, mm -hmm. who was great. Mm -hmm. But, you know, prior to that, like she likely I knew that she likely wasn't hanging out in the nightclubs and no. the bars anyway, yeah, you correct. know. And so I feel like the the dating apps, I mean, one of the best things about them is that you can do them from the comfort of your own home. Oh yeah. When you use them correctly, they can be very, very helpful, but most people use them very, very wrongly and they get angry about the results. Mm. Use them right. Yeah. So cool. I love this, man. Have you, did you, before you decided to become an expert in this topic, mm -hmm. had you struggled in relationships before yeah. meeting your wife? I did. I yeah. grew up with anxious attachment style myself. Wow. I was not avoidant. I was anxious. I was the other way, trying mm. to earn approval and things like that. Nice guy syndrome. And by the time I turned 20, I said, I can't live this way anymore. I, I need to fix this. I had to fumble through trying to fix it for myself all alone. And that's where my 10-step method comes from for my attachment boot camp course. It follows the way that I, I fixed it myself and then all the research I did backed it up. But I had to fix that for myself. And then I had to fumble through that at the beginning of the relationship with my wife, build those systems, have those meetings. It was hard. But you're still a nice guy. So what's changed? <laughs> There's a big difference between a nice guy and a kind man. A nice guy does things to try to earn approval and get things in return. Mm. A kind man is sovereign and can afford to be kind to other people and be really kind to them without demanding things in return. That's the difference. Wow. Yeah, important difference. Why is there such a stigma regarding men in therapy? Because mm -hmm. I mentioned therapy was a, played a big role for me personally. Mm -hmm. You know, I've... Um, I had a big tweet go around maybe a couple years ago, and it still makes the rounds, and people have picked it up and, and tried to make it their own for a while. But the tweet is approximately, it's roughly this. Therapy is designed in many pieces, many pieces of therapy, especially the more humanistic therapies, the more modern ones. They're designed for the ways that the female brain processes emotions and gets through them. Right? The female brain benefits from processing emotions with another person, talk therapy, processing, talking endlessly, and then feeling better about it Right, with the help of another person. Interesting. That's like the, sometimes the female fight or flight response is actually referred to as what the tend and befriend mm -hmm. response. Mm -hmm. And that's, they are looking for talking it through and processing and decreasing the agitation on the right side emotional brain with somebody else's logical left brain, right? And men can benefit from this, but the difference is that women get bonded to the other person as they're doing it, and that itself often solves many of the problems because now they feel safe with a person. Women are very relational in the way that they think and solve. They are relational, so the more relationships they have that are intimate and connected, the safer they tend to feel. Men are not so much that way, right? Men are solution-focused, and we want to achieve things. So when a man goes to therapy, most often, especially talk therapy, 
he goes through it and they talk and yeah, he feels a little better, but the problem is still there and he is agitated and he's frustrated. And now he's just going somewhere, telling someone over and over and over how he feels with no results, with no changes. And he starts to feel like a, a crying child endlessly and he doesn't like that feeling. Hmm. So most men cut therapy off or they hear about that from others and refuse to go. Many of them have been raised by fathers that said, you just suffer and die in silence. That's what men do, right? So we have all of that built in. Men need solutions, which is why men, it's interesting, men will shoot themselves before they hire a therapist, but they will hire a coach mm. with no problem. They'll pay a coach, right, in athletics and in business and anything. Hey, give me your knowledge. So when a male coach for psychology and relationships comes along, it feels a little more comfortable than a therapist. So coaching leads to solutions, and that's the beginning of the process. When it's solution-focused, and there is solution-focused therapy. That was my specialty back in the day. Wow. But when it's solution-focused, men come in by the, by the droves. You, you have to get a wait list. Hmm. But most men believe therapy will not bring a single solution. Interesting. Yeah, but it's just it's just semantics is what it is. Because I mean, the right therapist will give you a to do list. If Absolutely. That's what you want. And if you if you talk with them and say, this is what I need, let's accomplish this, then most of them will try to find that for you and help you do that. Although a lot of the more humanistic therapies that we're churning out so many, the mass majority of, of therapists these days, the humanistic therapies teach that your client has the solution. You just have to listen to them long enough and help them find their own solution. And that's not what men are looking for. Mm. Men are looking to make a connection and get a solution. Just tell me what to do. Is it the law of attraction where, you know, by by clearly are being able to articulate, like by meditating on what it is that you want and then clearly articulating it, the odds of you manifesting that which you seek become more likely. Like one of the, one of the things in therapy, my therapist told me to do, and and other people generally, not just my therapist, but you know, to create a before I met the girl that I'm currently with, create a list and be as specific as you can. For mm -hmm. example, mm -hmm. of all the many things, and the more specific the better. All the things that you want in a mm -hmm. partner. Mm -hmm. What's fascinating about that is. Yes, but no. Um, <laughs> yes, making the list and being clear is helpful to help you refine what you're looking for. That's number one. So you start filtering correctly and you filter out the wrongs so that you look for the right. And then number two, by articulating that carefully to the other person, you switch from the insecure pool of people who don't articulate, mm -hmm. who don't specify, who don't ask, and they just play games. And you become very clear over here into the secure pool who love it when you say, this is what I want. This is what I'm looking for. Here's what I'm asking. Can you do this? Here's what I'll do in return. This, you switch from one pool to the other, not just with dating, but with friendship, with professions. It makes it more intentional. More intentional. Yeah. The, the secure pool, they crave that from you and they value you. So they will say, I want to form a mutually fulfilling relationship with you for the next 50 years that is sustainable. Let's take care of each other. You want this? I am willing to give you that so that you stay in my life. Cool. Let's do that. It's sustainable. Boom. There you go. Here's what I'd like. I can return. Can you do this for me? Yes, I can. Boom. Done. This pool over here, the insecure pool, they're still busy trying to figure out what you want and trying to play games, trying to convince you how to figure out how to get from you what they want without ever telling you, right? Totally different pools. That's how you make that switch. Interesting. So it can, so, so it's helpful. Very helpful. It's very, it's the only way. It is the only way to fix loneliness and to build secure, lasting, sustainable relationships mm. that go for 50 years. It is the only way. You're forming that with your partner now, which is fantastic. It's going to carry you through friendships. It's going to carry you through professions. It's going to carry you through everywhere. The more you use those skills everywhere, the better your life's going to be. Wow. Yeah, I do this with myself every, actually every year for the past decade or so, or even longer. I would, at the end of the year, write myself a, a list of goals that I want to achieve in the year ahead. Mm. So I would do this every, you know, like la last week in December, put together a goal, uh, a list of goals, and I would just do it in my email app. Like mm -hmm. my email app, I would email it to myself. Mm -hmm. The subject would be goals 2024. And I remember for, um, and, and to be as specific as possible, right? Like mm -hmm. whether it's a certain, you know, income that you hope to achieve mm -hmm. or a certain uh, number of, of followers, if you happen to be in my profession, mm -hmm. you know, where that, mm -hmm. that kind of thing matters or listeners or book sales or what have you, you know, the more specific you could be, the better. And I remember for 2023, I actually went back and I looked because, you know, I think it's helpful to go back and see which of those goals you've achieved. And I actually, I end up achieving the majority of them because you just, it makes you really clear on what it is that you want. And I remember mm -hmm. 2023, I put, um, <laughs> admittedly pretty vague, but it was like, start a new fling, date seriously, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. 
And, uh, That's very avoidant right there, by the way. Is it very avoidant? <laughs> Why? I'm going to have a fling. I, yeah, I want to date seriously, but you know what? A fling sounds pretty good. I'm not sure. I want to hedge myself in. Yeah, I'd, right. lo- I'd like some love, but man, this would be great over here, right? You're right. And like then, then they get into an intimate relationship, uh, uh, and they're like, well, I haven't had my fling yet, so I better <laughs> cut this thing off so I can go have that fling, right? That's very avoidant. So. Well, I don't want anybody listening to this thing that, to think that I think that I have it all figured out. I no, certainly don't. That's all good. That's yeah. all good. No, and, and confronting that is beautiful because that's that's you you found that partner. You found that partner and you are taking the steps to lean into those hard conversations, which is what most men are afraid to do. Hmm. Right? Most men are terrified to lean in the conversations like you are. You are feeding her a level of intimacy. You are feeding and caring for her appropriately. You are giving her what she actually needs from you. It will be frightening at times. And when it is, the best thing you can do is tell her, this is frightening for me, but I want to continue. And if you can do that and she can answer you and say, I respect that. How can I help it be less frightening? Hmm. And you guys can take care of each other. You will get through anything. Wow. So powerful, man. I love your wisdom. I have been married for 15 years. I've been doing this for 15 years. This is my life. How did you and your wife meet? Friends of friends. Friends of friends. Our best friends were dating each other. So we connected through the friend network. That's why I know it works. Damn. That's awesome. Well, tell us more about your course. And I know you have like a discount code. To yeah. Audience, so right? for the audience at home, if you use code MAX50, you're going to get 50% off the attachment bootcamp course. You can throw that link in the show notes as well. So you guys can get better that way. Uh, it is... A very clear 10-step process if you want to go from insecure, lonely, afraid, to finding those good friends, finding really good friends that you can trust, filtering out the people you probably shouldn't have in your life, but you've kept there anyway because you don't want to be totally alone, right? Building an incredible dating relationship and building a great relationship with yourself so you respect yourself when you look in the mirror and leading into marriage, kids, a fulfilling life and beyond everything you're looking for in 10 clear steps, the attachment bootcamp course. I love that. And again, like the mind pump guys who to me are just like, they're wonderful legends in the living legends in the, in in the health and fitness industry. Yeah. They love you. (laughs) They're great. Yeah. Shout out to Sal, Adam, Justin, Doug. Those guys are great. I got to hang with them in London recently. Yeah. (laughs) Now that would be a blast. I can imagine (laughs) Justin like backflipping off of everything in London. (laughs) Yep. Yep. Yeah, there's a, it was a good time. It was a good time. Well, I've got one last question for you. Again, this was, this was super uh, illuminating. Thank you for coming in. Thank you for having me. Um, one last question before, before we get to that, where can people connect with you on social media? Yeah. If they have follow-up questions. Yeah. So my website is adamlanesmith.com where you'll find my course, my coaching, my private community, my books, everything is available on my website. I'm also on Instagram as at attachment Adam or as Adam Lane Smith. And I'm on YouTube as at attachment Adam or Adam Lane Smith. I'm everywhere. Love it. We'll come back whenever you want. Last question that gets asked to everybody on the show. What does living a genius life mean to you? It means taking care of business now so that you don't suffer later and miss 80% of the joy. And for most of us, that means attachment. Wow. Love it, dude. Thanks again. Absolutely. Hey, if you like that video, you need to check out this one here and I'll see you there.